And Daisy didn't prime either. Um, yeah, can I pray for you? Yes, please. Father, thank you so much for Daisy. And I just pray that as you would anoint her to speak and that the words that she would say would um, would not just be words that would be like, would go deep, but they would go deep and they would transform us. And they transform our lives. Um, and just remind her that scripture in Timothy, um, do not look down on do not, do, not let, do not look down on anybody who's young. I can't remember that. I'm, I'm butchering it. But basically, um, there we are. Daisy's got it. Um, and out of, yeah, I just feel like this is amazing. Uh, Daisy's preaching. Um, she's preaching on our series on Psalms. So if you aren't here before, um, you do know now. We're going through Psalms. Um, last week's preach will be put up online. I do apologize for that. Uh, uh, we're working on a technical difficulty, um, but that'll be up in the newsletter in the next, next uh, two weeks. Um, yeah, over to you, Daisy. Cool. Da, da, da. Mm-hmm. Cool, cool, cool. Um, hello, everyone. Hello. So, hello. Um, so, yeah, as Doug said, we just started a, um, like a series on Psalms. Tori set us up last week with like a really great, a really great preach on Psalm 139, which was amazing. Um, and yeah, I am doing another classic, Psalm 23. Um, and actually, when I was thinking about which Psalm to do, um, God gave me Psalm 23. And because it's such like a well-known piece of scripture, um, I actually like kind of ignored ignored it and was like, no, no, God, give me another one, give me another one. I, I don't want the pressure of doing Psalm 23. Um, but it kept popping up, so uh, we're doing it on Psalm 23. And it is one of my favorite Psalms. And it's just like a beautiful picture of like who God is and who he wants to be to us. Um, so yeah, so um, we'll read it. It's the next slide. Um, and I just like want us, to, because it's so common and so well known, I want us just to read it with like a fresh perspective and like a feeling of like weight knowing. Um, yeah, just like knowing like the strength and the beauty and power of this. Um, so it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, I have like a question just to start off with, um, and I want you to kind of like talk about it in like uh, like two or threes. Just what is your relationship with Psalm 23? Like, what do you think is like the most important part of the psalm? Is there a time when this psalm felt like important to you? So, yeah, just talk about it briefly um, with like something else. Go!
it's just like, so I always, I have fun with it. And like, you know, I think just like the imagery is beautiful. You know, like, it's something like, in all the bars and stuff. Like, you know, it's just, it's all the trick that you know.
So in the dictionary, a shepherd is a person who herds, tends or guides sheep. So we're going to break down what the psalm says about God being a shepherd into three main points. The first point is the good... No. Go on. No. Oh. That's it? No. Up again. That one. That one. Yay. <laughs> the good shepherd knows his sheep intimately. And a shepherd is different from someone who would, like works as a farmer or like raises cattle like they they know their sheep so individually um, and they would like spend time creating a close relationship with them they know their habits and their strengths and their weaknesses and um, they'd be there when the sheep is born and when the sheep is ill and when the sheep wanders off and then they could be there to bring it back again and jesus says back in the in the john passage it says i know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and i know the father and when i read this i was like oh my gosh i love this it's like jesus highlights here like that there is no deeper relationship in the world than the relationship between the trinity god the father the son and the holy spirit they've lived in in perfect harmony for all of eternity and um yeah and yet jesus leans into the closest most personal relationship he has with the father and he uses it to model his relationship with the sheep God is inviting us into this there's an opportunity to draw close to God again or maybe for the first time God wants this relationship with you he wants the relationship that carries like weight and depth and intimacy just like the relationship he has with the father so the next the next one is the good shepherd provides and restores. So David, who was a shepherd himself, would clearly have remembered what it was like to attentively watch and lovingly protect the sheep. And he knew that God had been doing the same thing for him. He could see how God had been providing for him um, and protecting him. And he knew that it was God who was doing these things. He would say, he makes me lie down and still with him. He leads me. So the rest of verse 1, so the first bit is, the Lord is my shepherd, and then it says, therefore I lack nothing. David is basically saying here, there is nothing I need that God has not or will not supply. And in other translations, um, it says, it could say, I shall not want. And I think this can be seen here as like both a declaration and a decision. I shall not want means all my needs are supplied by God, my shepherd. For me personally, I want to get to a point where I'm altogether completely satisfied with the way that God is like managing my life, like just fully trusting him in everything, whatever he's telling me. Um, or I shall not want could mean I decide to not desire more than what God gives me. And this isn't something that we do good in this world. <laughs> it isn't. The thought of us not wanting something or lacking anything is impossible um, because we always want things um, and we make the mistake of thinking that things that we want have the potential to satisfy us when they don't and there, there is a contradiction here for, for the serious reader of this psalm, it's a difficult psalm and it's meant to be difficult. For the majority of people in this world this isn't a reality, there are people going through war, wanting it to be over. There are people in abusive relationships wanting to be free of it. There are people on this street who are needing water and shelter, wanting to be, to be living in, in a different way of life. So the powerful question is, if this is God's declaration, and this is not what the world looks like, how do we respond? Well, firstly, we can be honest about it. One of the most powerful things that we can do when we see injustice is weep because it's difficult. What did Jesus do when Lazarus died? And what did he do when he was in the garden before he was about to get murdered? He wept. This psalm is a psalm without any easy answers. And N.T. Wright actually wrote a book called The Challenge of Jesus. There are challenges. Secondly, we can bring change for people who are experiencing this contradiction. And the reason why I'm um, like talking about this under this point of provision is God's provision is with us. Mm. And there are so many things that we can do, but one of the 
main things we can do is share God's love to those around us. And Paul says in Corinthians about having a ministry of reconciliation. And it says in, yeah, it says in Corinthians, it says, and God has made all things new and reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciling others to God. In other words, it was through the anointed one that God was shepherding the world, not even keeping records of their transgressions, and he has entrusted us the ministry of opening the door of reconciliation to God. We are ambassadors of the anointed one who carry the message of Christ to the world, as though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. So we tenderly plead with you on Christ's behalf. Turn back to God and be reconciled to him. We are ambassadors of the kingdom. And we and by sharing God's love and sharing the message of, of Jesus through the way that we live our life with each other can actually have a huge make a huge difference in closing the gap between this contradiction. So the second part of, of this um, like section nine, the, the next point. Um, God, the good shepherd restores. So the second part is the word restores. And yeah, the shepherd also knew the good places to make their sheep rest. He faithfully guided them to green pastures. And whenever I read this psalm and I think about green pastures, for me, I'm thinking of like, the field in our family cottage in Wales. There should be a picture. It's not of the cottage. We, this is like a picture that I, we dab took, I think, um, on our recent trip to Wales. Um, but this is what I'm thinking of, excluding me, this is what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of like green grass, like, yeah, and with just, yeah, like knee length and uh, up against blue sky. That's what I'm thinking of. But actually, what David was referring to it was completely different to this image. Um, this would have been, next image, this would have been more like what, G, uh, what David was referring to. Something that looks to us like completely barren, kind of rocky, rocky wilderness, basically. Um, a place where not much would grow, um, and a bit of geography for you guys. Um, only small tufts of grass would, gl- would grow around here, and what, what would happen is like warm air at night, warm air from the Mediterranean would like blow across the desert and would like hit up against like rocks and um, yeah, like hills and like little sprouts of grass would come up, but it would only be enough to um, feed like one mouthful for the sheep. So then they'd have to look to their shepherd to find the next bit of um, food and the next bit, so on and so forth. So in the green pastures that David is talking about, the sheep are completely relying on their shepherd. And if you're like me and you'd rather think of the green pastures as being the other image, um, there wouldn't be much point or much need for a shepherd. Um, And we live in a culture that tells us to value our own independence, but God is actually calling us to to be dependent on him and trusting him, that he'll lead us in every life. So the next part of this verse, it says, He leads me beside quiet waters and he refreshes my soul. So this is an image of God's provision and rest in place of quietness. God says, be still and know that I am God. And there's joy in stillness. But are we feeling these still waters often enough? We live such busy, fast-paced lives. And often that's when anxiety can, can become a way of life. Um, a bit about me, I spent, I spent a lot of, quite a big portion of my life definitely not near these still waters. Um, when I was 11, I was in, in a bus accident, and for uh, yeah, a big portion of my teenage years, um, I lived a life like full of anxiety and panic attacks, and it basically controlled, controlled my life. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't want to do things, and I, but I became very kind of good at masking it, so I didn't allow God into that space. Um, but actually, when I did allow God in, Jesus offered me like such a better way of living when I decided to follow him as my shepherd. He leads me to quiet waters and he refreshes or restores my soul. And this is beautiful. If we look into the word refresh or restore, it means to return or to come back to or to dwell. The restoring of our hearts begins with us returning to God. 
Anyone who has experienced the peace of God will also experience an absence of peace. So if we want to be restored, we have to continually be returning to God. And people often read this passage as if we're living amongst the green pastures, uh, but that's actually not what it's saying. Um, the truth is we're going to need constant restoring, uh, constant returning, um, because you'll, you'll return, and then you'll go off again, and you'll return, you'll go off. That's the implication, because that's what sheep do. And maybe you have wandered away too. Maybe due to shame, or due to distraction, or just how busy the world is, it's so easy just to wander away. Um, but just as the shepherd left the 99 um, to find that one sheep, God will do the same for you. He'll come running after you. And God is so willing to bring you back and to slow you down and to give you his peace. And when you turn your eyes upon Jesus, he will lead you to that resting place, to the oasis of peace in the midst of this crazy and anxious world. So the third point is the good shepherd protects and guides. So, yeah, it goes on to say, he leads me in the right paths for his name's sake. In the first part of this, we can understand he leads me along the right paths, but what does it mean for his name's sake? Well, it means for his glory. And this for me feels, feels uncomfortable. This is God leading us on a path that is considered to be the right path in order for his word to be fulfilled. But actually, that means that it might clash with my path and, and the way that I want my life to go. And, and I, I don't know whether many of you know about the story of my gap year, but um, I'm just coming to the end of my gap year. Um, and I, this wasn't the plan for my gap year. I wasn't intending on moving into community and, and all of that. I had applied to do um, a completely different course at university and I've always been um, someone who's like, as soon as I can get out of Bristol, I will. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then now I'm doing a three year course in Bristol. So um, yeah, and I've learned a lot about how God has, yeah, how good God's path is. Um, and it's a path of purpose and it's a path of healing. But what does it mean for his glory? Well, God is the most glorious being in existence. And it says in the Bible that we are created in the image of God to share in his glory. <laughs> and I was having a conversation with Johnny, like, last week about this, saying, like, I just don't understand this part of the verse, like, and actually, you explained it really well. And you said, we need to have the confidence that actually we can hear God's voice. And we do know how he works. And humility is about remembering the gifts and successes we have are not our own, but actually are gifts that God has given us. And when we're doing life right, this should be the natural outcome. When I'm working at the cafe, uh, working like at, at my best and greeting customers the, the, the way that I should be, that's giving glory to God. And when you're at work and or interacting with friends who are who are going through a difficult time and you're you're meeting them in that place, that's giving glory to God. So the next part is the good shepherd protects. So one of my favorite part of, uh, the psalm, uh, of this psalm is verse four. And it says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. And this picture would have come from when David was leading his sheep in really dangerous and really vulnerable um, areas. Um, David, but David makes it clear here that even when you're following God, you will still walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which is another translation. And there is nothing good in this valley. This valley is a valley of depression, it's a valley of loneliness, it's a valley of self-doubt, it's a valley of grief. And David knew this valley, he, he knew it really well, he spent a lot of his life in this valley. And yet there was no fear in David here. There's no, and there was no fear simply because who, <coughs> who he was with. He says, even though, so it's inevitable, but he says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. And it goes on to talk about in this psalm, it says, uh, about preparing a table in the presence of our enemies. And I want to note here that David could imagine the goodness of God even in the midst of the suffering. Despite who we are eating with, um, at 
the table that God has prepared or who we're in the valley with, even if it's our darkest enemies, peace is still an option. Because this is the Lord's dinner party. He prepares a table for you in the midst of your enemies. God's care doesn't eliminate the presence of your enemies, but it enables us to experience God's goodness even in this way. And the truth is, there is an actual expression of the valley of suffering in this room. Yeah, and if there's anything that ever unites a, a, a room of people, it's suffering, because at one point or not in our lives, we would have experienced suffering. Um, and so to have church and to, to sing worship together and to live in community together, it means we invite people to come into a space with everything that exists within them mm. and look to God who is holding it all. And one, one profound element of how the psalm ends is how the psalm ends. And it ends with saying, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy walk beside me. They walk beside you. You're walking with Jesus in this. Are you walking with Jesus in this part of your life? Because that's going to define the way that you see the value of suffering. And that's going to define the way that you walk through it. So do you know that through, through, through the suffering, you are surrounded by God's love and grace? Do you know that even though we walk through the valley, we won't dwell there? It's not a destination point, it's, it's just part of the journey. Because there is an invite to do this with God, allowing him into the journey. And surely goodness and mercy will follow you. So, I don't know how long I've been speaking for, but <laughs> if you're feeling like you're in this valley right now, or if you feel like you need freedom, uh, from it, or if you feel like you need a reminding, a reminding of, um, of God being a shepherd, then I want us to like spend some time praying for one another. Um, um, so yeah, but I'll just end with praying. Um, and yeah. So God, I just thank you for today. I just thank you for the opportunity to learn about you. Um, I just thank you for this psalm. I thank you for the beauty of this psalm. And I thank you that you, you are just a uh, yeah, showing us as, you, as a shepherd that you devote yourself to us, to protecting us and to guiding us. And despite whether in the, we're in the valley or we're in the pasture, God, like we ask for you to just make yourself known. God, we just want to hear your voice, we want to see you, um, and know that you're with us. <coughs> yeah, we pray this in your name. Amen. 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 put their PowerPoint presentation together while wearing the same colours as what they were doing. I try my best. <laughs>